Today, the alien barbarians of the West, the lowly organs of the legs and feet of the world, are dashing across the seas, tramping other countries underfoot, and daring with their squinting eyes and limping feet to override the noble nations. What manner of arrogance is this? Japan had managed to keep the alien barbarians at bay for more than 200 years. But now, in the mid-19th century, the West was poised to assert itself. The shogun is faced with a strategic threat on three fronts. From the north, the Russians are coming. From the south, the British are coming. And ultimately, from the east, the Americans come. The new country of the United States of America was on the move. Japan was known to have large coal deposits and something else in abundance. Whales. Whale oil, which literally greased the wheels of American industry, was a multi-million dollar business. Whale hunters had depleted the North Atlantic oceans. Now America looked eastward to Japan. If that double-bolted land Japan is ever to become hospitable, it is the whale ship alone to whom the credit will be due. So wrote Herman Melville in his classic tale of the great white whale that haunted the waters off Japan. By the time Moby Dick was published in 1851, the United States was ready to assert its power. Japan's leaders were aware of the growing push towards their shores. The shogunate had been preparing for the arrival of the West for decades. They had set up a special translation bureau, which was gathering information about the West, translating atlases, translating dictionaries, developing a set of foreign affairs specialists. Key advisors warned of an imminent foreign threat they urged the shogun to bolster his defenses. We should build warships. Then if barbarians come to our sea, we should shoot every single one of them. Others feared that Japan could not serve as a worthy opponent to the West. Their weaponry and ships had not changed since closing the doors to Europe 200 years before. There was no resolution. Then, early in the morning on July 2nd, 1853, a local fisherman reported this strange sight. I was told there were ships on fire. I ran up to the mountain to get a good look. The ships came nearer and nearer until the shape of them showed us they were not Japanese ships but foreign, and what we had taken for a conflagration on sea was really the black smoke rising out of the smokestacks. These steamships dwarfed any ship ever built in Japan. To the Japanese, they were the Kurofune, the black ships of evil appearance. On board were some 60 cannons and almost 1,000 Americans. And they landed not in the foreigner's port of Nagasaki, but rather in the forbidden waters of Edo Bay, the shogun's own capital city. Upon hearing the news, the shogun immediately fell ill. Many said from the shock of hearing that a foreign naval squadron was at his doorstep. His advisors tried to deal with the crisis. Fresh messages arrived one after the other. The situation seemed so sudden, so formidable, and so important. Orders were issued to the great clans to keep strict watch, as if it were possible that these barbarian vessels might proceed to acts of violence. In a desperate show of force, the shogunate sent a squadron of guard boats to surround the American ships. 
the Japanese officer ordered the ships to leave. Their commander, Commodore Matthew C. Perry, ignored him. I was well aware that the more exclusive I should make myself and the more exacting I might be, the more respect these people of forms and ceremonies would award me. 5,000 samurai warriors armed with swords and antiquated cannons lined the shores. Again, their chief officer commanded Perry, leave Edo Bay immediately. The Commodore refused. I endeavor to inculcate the idea that the government of the United States is superior in power and influence to Japan. The honor of the nation calls for it, and the interest of commerce demands it. The Japanese on shore watched as Perry's crews readied for action. Cannons were loaded, guns were drawn. Perry came ashore. Perry presented his papers and delivered his ultimatum. He would be back and he expected Japan to comply with America's demand to open the country for trade. If not, he was prepared to take Japan by force. He would return in the spring for his answer. Then he and his squadron left Edo Bay. Their deportment and manner of expressions were exceedingly arrogant, and the resulting insult to our national dignity was not small. Those who heard could but gnash their teeth and suffer this insult in silence. After the barbarians had retired, a certain person drew his sword and slashed to bits a portrait of their leader, Perry. There was great fear of Perry. There were uh, the, the portraits of Perry as a devil. There were the portraits of his ships belching fire. All of this served to, to whip up you know, near hysteria on the part of, of portions of the Japanese populace. At the same time, there's fascination. There's fascination with Perry. There's fascination with these ships, these enormous ships that hadn't been seen before. There's fascination with the technological prowess of the Americans. To complicate matters, the shogun had died, and the new shogun was mentally unfit. His advisors took charge, but they could not reach agreement. The head of the shogunate decides that he is going to poll all of the daimyo in Japan. What should the shogunate do? Uh, this is a radical break with tradition. The, the authority of the shogunate is to deal with foreign relations. And the title of the shogun, of course, is the great barbarian quelling generalissimo. And yet here is the head of the shogunate asking the daimyo what he should do. Two positions are staked out, one being known as the open the country argument. The Americans do not understand the ethics of humanity and justice. There will be no choice but to start trade with them. The other side being revere the emperor and expel the barbarian. The Americans have come to seize Japan. Therefore, if we don't drive them away now, the other foreign powers will follow. We are in a dangerous situation. While the debate raged, the shogunate remained indecisive. The end of the year was filled with half-hearted compromises and inadequate attempts at coastal defense. Then in February, Perry returned earlier than expected. This time, his show of force was even more ominous. He arrived with double the ships and crew. The honor of the Japanese had been challenged, but they had no means to defend it. Their only hope lay in negotiation. As soon as Perry came ashore, the talks began. They went on into the night and for the next 23 days.
In the end, the treaty was a compromise, which served both countries' interests. Perry got what he wanted, which was to establish a relationship between Japan and the United States. The shogunate got what it wanted in not surrendering its control over foreign relations and opening Japan up to unregulated trade. I'm not sure that the shogunate has been given enough credit for choosing peace over war. And you can say that the, that the shogunate chose to open up relations with America and the West out of weakness, but it didn't have to. The shogunate took the practical decision and they chose peace and thereby preserved the integrity and territorial sovereignty of their country. Before signing the treaty with Perry, the shogun arranged a social evening, a prerequisite for conducting business in Japan that continues to this day. Sumo wrestlers displayed their strength. The first one invited Perry to punch him in the stomach. Another wrestler hoisted two huge bags of rice over his head to show his strength. Perry offered champagne and whiskey. He gave the Japanese gifts. Among those of particular interest, a telegraph, a camera, and a quarter-scale steam railroad, unlike anything the Japanese had ever seen. Japanese engineers would quickly make plans to replicate them. Three days later, the agreement was signed. It was not long before Japan signed trade agreements with Russia, England, France, and Holland. Despite its accommodation to the West, the days of the Tokugawa dynasty were numbered. No longer was the warrior class to control the destiny of Japanese society. Within 10 years, the samurai were officially disbanded. But the samurai ethic had been indelibly engraved into Japanese culture. In 1868, the 15th shogun stepped down. With his departure, 265 years of rule by the Tokugawa family had come to an end. The modern era of Japan had begun.